So it's a pleasure to be here with you. We're going to be tackling a subject that we haven't tackled that much. This is new and it's very interesting. It's next generation neurosteroids in the treatment of major depressive disorder and of postpartum depression as well. So you have our disclosures. I'm not going to spend too much time. This is going to, uh, this, we're going to be discussing a neurosteroid that is not yet approved for the treatment of major depression. Uh, so it's a bit off label in that sense. Um, but it's quite interesting. We need new targets, don't we? We need new opportunities, don't we? So the learning objectives are to identify risk factors and symptomatology associated with both postpartum, also called peripartum depression, and major depressive disorder, and to improve accurate diagnosis. Then my colleague is really going to discuss the diverse pathophysiologic mechanisms that may contribute to major depression and postpartum depression. You're going to find that quite interesting. Yesterday I came into to the uh, rehearsal and I said, do you mind if I do a Vulcan mind melt with you? Because he is so knowledgeable. You're going to love it, okay? Um, we're going to also summarize the role of GABAergic signaling and pathways in the neurobiology of major depression and postpartum depression, and to translate the mechanisms of action and available efficacy and safety data surrounding next generation neurosteroids to informed therapeutic decisions, practical decisions in treating major depression. So we're gonna be talking again about recognizing major depression and postpartum depression prevalence and burden. Be aware that really major depression and postpartum depression are not to be differentiated as much as discussed in terms of when they occur. When a, de a major depressive episode occurs within the pregnancy or first, it starts within the first month after delivery, that is considered postpartum depression. That's what the DSM-5 says. And many other people feel that can happen also outside those parameters, up to six months. But technically speaking, strictly speaking, that is the definition. So the emotional lability that people ex uh, uh, exhibit during the early postpartum phase was the most important predictor of postpartum depression in, in several of the articles that I reviewed. And so we know that emotional lability after uh, delivery, it does occur, doesn't it? The postpartum blues occur. But they usually are short-lived. They're about up to, say, uh, 10 days, happens within the first week. And it's time limited. And it is not persistent for most people. However, postpartum blues can also move on to become a postpartum depression. So it's a risk factor, another risk factor. Other risk factors that are of concern, marital status, marital conflict, history of depression in the family, and or history of depression in the person who is just delivered, including history of anxiety. And there is good data that family history is a strong predictor. There's heritability of postpartum depression in almost half of the people who exhibit it. So it's, it's a major uh, predictor do get that history. Inadequate social supports are another thing. People who often are having a hard time struggling before they get pregnant and during pregnancy struggle even more after pregnancy. And one of the things that we've known is that sleep deprivation over a long period of time can also be a predictor of depression overall. But postpartum depression, yes. And hormonal fluctuations of estrogen and progesterone after delivery are dramatic and can result in significant sleep abnormalities, which when you have an infant who's not on a schedule and is also keeping you up as a young mom can be even worse. And that is another major predictor of postpartum depression. So risk factors, previous adverse life events, and um, they are often leading to epigenetic changes. And of course, sleep, uh, uh, sleep uh, um, difficulties, especially in the first few weeks 
Now we know what major depression is, nine target symptoms. You, either, you have to have either depressed mood or loss of interest, pleasure, anhedonia, or both. And a total of five of these symptoms in order to have a major depression. It has to be at least two weeks in time, it has to be most of the time, and it has to cause significant difficulty with functionality uh, at home, at work, or in social, occupational, or uh, other ways of functioning. So it has to cause disability. One of the things we have confusion with in postpartum is women often don't sleep well, as I've mentioned. So that's one of the nine. They also have a problem when it comes to fatigue. That's another one you s normally see in a healthy pregnancy without postpartum depression. And their, their weight can change, their appetite can change pretty dramatically. So three of the nine are already embedded, if you will. And so it's a little more difficult, but I'd still use this tool, the PHQ-9, which is the self-administered easy way of going after the cognitive, emotional, and physical symptoms that are described in the nine symptom complex. Here again, epidemiologic catchment survey showing predisposition to uh, sleep problems causing depression and persisting. Remember, when we talk about depression, we talk about a major depressive episode. You cannot make a diagnosis of unipolar depression without first ruling out bipolar depression. And so it's paramount that you take the time with your patient, and especially in peripartum, postpartum depressions, because the rates there of having bipolarity are between 20 and 50% almost up to half of your population. So bipolar disease is very important to rule out because your treatment is gonna to be totally different, as you know. How do you rule it out? Well, you've gotta look at family history, loaded family history is much more common in bipolar than unipolar. Your course of illness, all the, the, the early depressive uh, out, uh, outcomes that normally are there with shorter depressive episodes, good intercurrent functioning between episodes, you know, uh, seasonality. Treatment response, very important. Antidepressant misadventures happen all the time. Either you don't respond, or you respond quickly and then you lose it. Or you respond and you never lose it. You keep going up, the elevator keeps rising. So antidepressant misadventures, very, very important. Mania symptoms, you've gotta look for them, don't you? There are some scales that are available the mood disorder questionnaire is good for beginning to give you a, an index of suspicion that there may be bipolar. Remember, one out of five people with a major depressive episode is in the bipolar spectrum. And associated features, especially unevenness in relationship, frequent career changes, substance use disorders are huge. 21 to 54% of women with postpartum depression are in that spectrum. And one of the things that, here's something very interesting. Do any of your relatives suffer from mental illness? No, they, they all seem to enjoy it. We make light. We have to put some humor into this, don't we? But the truth is, it's devastating. And it's devastating not only for the mom, but for the baby, for the whole family, for the whole family. And one of the worst outcomes, as you know, is that the rates of suicidality are much higher in that, that segment, that bipolar segment, than even in unipolar, and it's usually violent, and it's often associated not only with suicide, but neonaticide, infanticide, uh, very, very sad. So very important that we take this seriously and really rule out. So available, available tools, research, you know, we're using the Madras and the HAMD. Here in primary care and in OBG and in uh, other uh, disciplines where you don't have the time to do a, a very thorough evaluation, you can use a validated instrument like the PHQ-9. But if you're going to do that, you're also gonna be able then to track how they're doing as you go along. And also, you must do mood disorder questionnaire, or another good bipolar screener.
Remember, sensitivity is not that good. You have to go back and do a more structured interview, hopefully with family members. As you know, bipolars do not usually talk about their illness as it's a problem. They love being in the hypomanic state or manic state. So that being said, make sure you have co collaborative history. And one other tool that has been well established is the Edinburgh Post postnatal depression scale, a score of 12 or greater on this scale, validated scale, is highly indicative, has a little better sensitivity and specificity than does the PHQ-9, so I would definitely do that. Non-pharmacologic treatment, in milder, mild to moderate cases, therapy, both cognitive behavioral, if available, and interpersonal, can be extraordinarily helpful, also with young nursing moms. They don't want to take medication, nor do you want it to go into the, all, all the medications we use are expressed in breast milk. So the best way to go, therapy, if at all possible. Mild to moderate depression, complementary therapies, exercise, wonderful sunlight, wonderful. So try to use all we have. But if you have to use medication, we do have an armamentarium, don't we? We have a lot of tools. The problem is, that's, that sometimes they, they work and sometimes they just don't work. Star D was a perfect example. Uh, here's an example also of what it looks like, an antidepressant response. This is a, a, a wonderful slide that uh, Vladimir gave to me to use. It shows some people doing worse, some people doing better, some people doing just the same. It's all over the place. Why is that? Why do you think that is? Because depression isn't one disease, is it? It's a number of illnesses that end up in this syndrome complex we call major depression. But it's multiple diseases. Maybe it's ADHD, maybe it's bipolar, maybe it's a personality disorder, maybe it's substance use. You don't know what it is. And when you start to treat, you don't know what kind of response you're necessarily going to get. And so we do know from, from data from Star D and so forth that it's diminishing returns every time we try another step, diminishing returns. And so with that, I'm going to turn the program over to my esteemed colleague, and he's going to talk about a new target, a new way of approaching depression, which I think you're going to find quite interesting. Here you go, Vlad. Thank you very much, Brandon. Uh, so indeed, we have seen that uh, many treatments uh, used in major depressive disorder so far so far relate to changes in monoamine transmission. Be it that we block enzymes that metabolize monoamines, be it that we block uptake or directly interfere with receptor function. So both antidepressants and even second generation antipsychotics which are approved as adjunctive treatments, ultimately we're modulating monoamines. So we're trying to address this very complex condition as, as Brandon has pointed out. But we are composing a symphony using only three notes. Serotonin, epinephrine, and dopamine in all kinds of variations. That is our alphabet in treatment of MDD. So it is time to expand our alphabet. And therefore, we will speak a little bit about uh, using GABA modulating agents. Uh, some mention of glutamate will also be there and how these new compounds may interface with stress and also pathophysiology of major depressive disorder. So be prepared for something like this to happen. In ancient times, mariner, uh, mariners navigated by looking at the North Star. It was very reliable. If you want to sail south, just sail opposite of where North Star is. Keep it behind you. And then one day, they crossed the equator. Of course, they have no idea what happened. The next night, they look up in the sky. There's no North Star. Instead of North Star, there is now Southern Cross. They are totally disoriented. So, so the point of this talk is you do not feel like ancient mariners who have just crossed the equator. This is in preparation 
of how GABA and glutamate modulating uh, medications may interface with pathophysiology of major depressive disorder. And it is not a simple story. It is a complex story. So speaking about GABA receptors, you know, we've been used to, there are a lot of serotonin receptors, uh, all, truth be told, but there are several dozen different GABA receptors only. And they're built of five components, and therefore they're called pentameric, five components. Now there are approximately 19 components so far, uh, named by Greek letters. And it is different composition of these components that uh, provide specific qualities for these GABA receptors. Now, unlike serotonin uh, receptors and monoamine receptors, there is something tricky about GABA receptors in they can change their composition. So there are a lot of moving parts to this story. I will just try to identify for you two broad categories. One are GABA receptors, GABA-A receptors, that contain an alpha and gamma-2 unit. So these two are identifiers of intrasynaptic receptors. So if they are in synapse, they will have gamma-2, they'll have one of the alpha units. They're involved in regulating phasic GABA signaling. So some major excitatory process has occurred. It needs to be soothed, calmed down. You have phasic GABA response. On the other hand, there are different GABA receptors that contain delta unit. The ones that contain delta unit are extrasynaptic. They're outside the synapse. And they modulate tonic GABA signaling. So this is the ongoing drip of GABA and ongoing low-grade inhibition. So they have remarkably uh, uh, different uh, 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 roles. Uh, beyond that, uh, GABA receptors can be intrasynaptic, they can be extrasynaptic, they have many different locations. Uh, so uh, this is what this uh, heteropentamer may look like. And you see alpha units and beta units. Uh, uh, something that I will, this is all new, so I'm going to be a little bit demanding of you. But try to remember, see these yellow circles? This is where GABA binds. See little yellow circles uh, on the graph? So GABA binds between alpha and beta components of the receptor. On the other hand, something else that is really important to us, benzodiazepines, they modulate GABA receptors. And please remember, they bind between alpha and those gamma-2 units meaning that they mostly modulate phasic GABA signaling inside the synapse. And then we have so-called Z drugs, uh, S-Zolpicon, Zolpicon, Zolpidem sleep medications. They tend to bind in the vicinity of alpha-1 unit. So uh, just to share with you, be ready for surprises. So try to remember the location of where, where these uh, relative ligands uh, will bind because it has a lot to do with what you do, believe it or not, in your office tomorrow or next week. So what are neuroactive steroids? As the name would suggest, they have to do with neural function. They all work in the brain, but they're also synthesized by neural cells. And when I say neural cells, it is not only neurons, but glia cells, especially osteoglia and oligodendroglia, have a major role in synthesizing these compounds. Now, many of them are synthesized from progesterone, including pregnanolone and allopregnanolone. So the origin, and this gives, gives you an idea, has to do with pregnancy. Greek word, Pregnancy, pre and nascent, before birth. Pregnancy, period, before birth. So a lot of these hormones have been associated with pregnancy. Uh, when it comes to 
male steroid hormones. Now, these are sexual uh, hormones. Uh, testosterone is included here. Um, testosterone comes from testes. Uh, testes uh, is Latin word for witnesses. I'm not going to elaborate on this origin. <laughs> but uh, uh, suffice it to say, testament, witness last will, has to do with that. Testify to witness also has to do with that. And finally, some of the female hormones uh, have to do with estrogen, estradiol. Uh, they also have interesting etiology. Uh, they are related to female sexual function, amongst other things. So they are named after ancient pagan goddess of fertility, whose name was Estra. Uh, by the way, in case it sounds familiar, Easter, Estra's animal was hare, as in rabbit. There, therefore, we have a much softened Disney version with Easter bunny. But the previous meaning of, again, Easter, very different, just pointing out that these steroid hormones have a role in regulating many different processes, but our emphasis today will be neurosteroids. And they uh, uh, have much more specific role in neuromodulations. Uh, many of them are both positive and negative allosteric modulators of GABA-A receptors. So they can turn them up, they can turn them down, and in addition to GABA receptors, they also modulate, believe it or not, NMDA glutamate receptors. So they work both sides of the seesaw. So they can start from pro, pro, uh, uh, progesterone to pregnenolone. Um, the initial compound for all of them is cholesterol. And they can also lead from testosterone. In the end, you end up uh, with allopregnanolone, which is present both in, in males and females. And we see that uh, via modulation of GABA-A receptors, there's a role in depression, in anxiety, in modulation of stress. And by modulating NMDA glutamate receptors, uh, neurosteroids may have relevance for dementias. They may have relevance for schizophrenia. They may have relevance co for cognitive disorders. And a lot of the compounds that modulate to this alpha-5 unit are now being explored, believe it or not, in autistic spectrum disorders. So they uh, have a wide ranging potential. And here we see that the neurosteroids not only influence GABA-A receptor function as uh, positive allosteric modulators, but they also can modulate the activity of NMDA glutamate receptors. You also see that NMDA receptor is tetrameric four units as opposed to uh, GABA-A receptor pentameric five units. Something that has uh, been of a lot of interest in, in recent years is there a relationship between GABA-A signaling and BDNF? And there indeed is, because with GABA signaling, there will be a change in ion transport, because ultimately, GABA receptor is conformed around a chloride channel. And its activation opens the chloride channel leading to hyperpolarization. That is how it is an inhibitory uh, receptor, inhibitory neurotransmitter. Uh, by entrance of chloride, there will be also activation of intracellular calcium as a second consequence. That the activation of calcium will impact on something that is called extra extracellular signal, regulated kinase or ERK. When that is synthesized, that leads to synthesis of BDNF. BDNF is released, binds to its receptor, and what does it do? It pulls in gamma units of uh, GABA receptors. In other words, if you have excessive GABA signaling leading to excessive inappropriate uh, inhibition, it will activate BDNF, which will then downregulate GABA signaling. So there's a built-in regulatory system. Now, I wish we had this slide animated. And I mentioned to you that there will be something that will be directly applicable to your practice. It has to do with chronic stress. So what is the situation like before stress in normal circumstances? 
Uh, here you have ends, these are neurosteroids, they bind to alpha subunits. There is GABA binding between beta and alpha subunits. And then you have benzos. Remember, benzos bind between alpha and gamma-2 subunits. And I mentioned that GABA receptors are fickle and prone to change. So in chronically stressful situations, something unusual happens. Alpha-1 and alpha-2 units become less pronounced. Gamma-2 becomes less pronounced. What is the ramification? When somebody's stressed out, here is a little bit benzo that will help you. When people are stressed out, benzos bind here. The affinity for benzos decreases. Where do these sleeping medicines bind? They bind to alpha-1. Decreased. So oddly enough, in chronically stressful situations, benzos and Z drugs are least likely to be effective. And what is upregulated? What is upregulated are uh, alpha-4 and alpha-5 units, and these are the sites where neurosteroids work. Especially if you want to have change in tonic inhibition. Too much stress, cool things down. We need tonic inhibition. Here we have extrasynaptic GABA-A receptors with their delta units that are upregulated and you have robust function of neurosteroids. So in exceptionally stressful situations, chronic stress, which is one of the major precipitants of major depressive disorder, that is where we actually have diminished function of benzodiazepines. Even GABA is not doing so great, but neurosteroids as a positive modulators of, of GABA are amping up GABA transmission in those circumstances, especially tonic GABA transmission, right? So as soon as we have some of these agents available, this becomes immediately useful knowledge. I've spoken about stress response. In pregnancy, there is a little bit of buffer from stress. And here is how that buffer works. So we, are look, oops. so we are looking at one of the neurons in autonomic ganglia, in autom autonomic nucleus. This is nucleus stria terminalis. So it is one of the major autonomic nuclei. And what we have is encephalines acting through new opioid receptors. So in pregnancy, there is increased synthesis of encephalines. Activation of those receptors leads to decreased release of norepinephrine. There is also increased GABA signaling because in pregnancy, there is more progesterone, more allopregnanolone. So these norepinephrine-releasing neurons are down-regulated in pregnancy. So one builds a little bit of resilience to stress. On the other hand, we are also looking at one of the hypothalamic nuclei, I'm sorry, one of the hypothalamic neurons. And these are the ones that are in charge of releasing CRF. So this is a releasing factor for corticosteroids. It is revved up by norepinephrine, but remember, norepinephrine levels are pretty low. In addition to that, uh, this CRH or CRF neuron is being tonically inhibited by GABA signals. But then childbirth occurs. And all these processes that were just bumping along as Brits would sway swimmingly, there is a big change. This sympathetic neuron is no longer inhibited, starting to pump out norepinephrine. That norepinephrine is revving up CRF release. And on the other hand, because in pregnancy there was progesterone and AP allopregnanolone, these dip after pregnancy and therefore GABA tone is diminished. And all of a sudden, right after childbirth, sensitivity to stress jumps up. Both CRF and norepinephrine transmission are ramped up. It's an interesting story, but maybe part of the explanation of why postpartum depression, and why is this such a vulnerable period?
I mentioned that GABA and glutamate are in coexisting relationship, reciprocal relationship. How does that work? Well, this is one of the pyramidal glutamate neurons in the prefrontal cortex. Uh, you remember, uh, depending on your age, your parents or maybe your old grandparents' radio, where it had two knobs. One knob would be tuning the station, one knob regulates volume. That is what GABA interneurons do to glutamate transmission. Because you have two types of GABA interneurons, ones that release somatostatin, and they're called SST, GABA interneurons, and they will synapse with dendrites. They regulate signal to noise ratio. They make sure that we are well tuned to the station, that there is clear signal coming in. And if there is clear signal coming in, this glutamate neuron is going to respond. And how it responds depends on this parvalbumin GABA interneuron. This is a different type of GABA interneuron. You see it synapses at uh, this junction between the body and axon of GABA neuron, and it regulates the volume. So GABA does the same to glutamate as those old radios. Tune the station, adjust the volume. Very, very important interaction. And by the way, they are so closely interrelated that whenever you have a change in, in GABA transmission, you will have a corresponding change in glutamate and vice versa. Otherwise, what would happen? Well, think about when people overdose on GABA-boosting medications such as barbiturates, have too much inhibition, people die. If you change the balance in a different direction, too much glutamate, not enough GABA, people have seizures. Neither is good. Their relationship, their balance has to remain. Therefore, again, we have to keep in mind when modulating one of these systems, we're modulating the other. So is there any evidence suggesting that there is a change in GABA signaling in, or allopregnanolon signaling in individuals uh, who are experiencing depression. And indeed there is. As you can see, the lower allopregnanolon levels, the more severe depression. So this is now human evidence. And then we're seeing that there is an ongoing treatment with antidepressants. By the way, uh, antidepressants used in the study were SSRIs. SSRIs increase allopregnanolone. It's one of the mechanisms of action of these medications. And the greater the increase in allopregnanolone, uh, the more we see improvement in depression. This here is now improvement in depression. So if you have large increase in allopregnanolone, you have 80%, 100% improvement in depression. So even some of the medicines where we thought we knew what they were doing, there was actually a sleight of hand and another mechanism engaged that we may not have been fully aware of. So how about GABA in major depressive disorder? Something that may address some points that Brandon has made. So we're looking at healthy volunteers and we're looking at folks who have non-treatment resistant depression. So these folks are responding to monoamine treatments. Their GABA levels are pretty much the same as healthy volunteers. But how about if they are treatment resistant? Their GABA levels are significantly reduced. And something that is of clearly of interest to us, the lower GABA levels are the earlier onset of major depressive disorder. So now we are beginning to see that GABA is actually one of the major players in major uh, depressive disorder. So quick summary of what we have covered. Neurosteroids are synthesized in central and peripheral nervous system, and they have a role in modulating GABA-A receptors. They can be both positive and negative. They can dial up or dial down. They act as dimmers for GABA-A function. Uh, neuroactive steroids participate in stress response regulation of mood, anxiety, memory, neuroplasticity, and even pain threshold. 
and allopregnanolone, one of the neurosteroids, and GABA are clearly involved and altered in individuals who have major depressive disorder. Uh, let's move on. This is where things get a tad bit complicated. So <laughs> we do know that inflammation is also one of the risk factors for major depressive disorder. And these inflammatory signals uh, come from the periphery and they activate one Malox pink cell in the brain, which is microglia. And when microglia resonant immune cell becomes activated, it starts releasing inflammatory cytokines, reactive oxygen, and nitrogen species. And the more microglia is activated, and the more disturbance in astrocyte function, please keep in mind, astrocytes are source of half of the GABA in the brain. So the more you disrupt GABA signaling from astrocyte, and the more you cause astrocyte to start releasing inflammatory cytokine, the more disruption of glutamate function you have. What will soothe? What will calm down microglia? GABA released from astrocytes. We do know from in vitro experiments, cuts down on inflammatory signaling from microglia by 50%. So again, GABA has a major role in so-called neuroinflammatory theory of depression. Uh, if, if things are disturbed to a significant extent, too much inflammation and decrease in neurotrophic factor ultimately ends up damaging oligodendroglia and white matter tracts become disrupted and brain areas become disconnected, uh, leading to depression which is very difficult to treat. So you see another role in regulating neuroinflammatory response. And we also see that astrocytes maintain, maintain balance between GABA and glutamate because they contain something that is glutamine. Glutamine, when handed off to GABA uh, neurons, is turned into GABA. Glutamine, when it is handed off to glutamate neurons, is turn, turns into glutamate. So the trafficking of that intermediary product and thereby keeping balance between GABA and glutamate is achieved by astrocytes. We see also that microglia can be exposed uh, to both GABA and glutamate uh, based on preliminary evidence. It looks like glutamate promotes inflammatory transformation of microglia while GABA through GABA-A receptors calms down this inflammatory phenotype of microglia. Uh, why might that be relevant to us? Because we do now know that increased neuroinflammation leads to severity of depression. How do we know? Because we can measure transformation of microglia. As microglia transform, there's a compound that is being released, and that is this TSPO, or translocator protein. This is something that uh, we can image, and what we're finding out, that the more inflammatory conversion of microglia, the more, more severe depression uh, measured by Hamdi Hamilton depression rating scale. So key learning points. GABA does have a role in regulating microglia function and or inflammation. Uh, astrocytes are important GABA producers in central nervous systems, and astrocytes are involved in regulating this GABA glutamate balance. Uh, severity of MDD may coincide with activation of microglia. Uh, by the way, if we do postmortem studies in individuals uh, who have died while depressed, one thing that we're going to find out is nerve cells are shriveled up, but they are there in numbers the cells that are missing are astrocytes. On the other hand, if somebody has died while depressed due to natural causes, there is no change in their microglia number. But if they have died while depressed as a result of suicide, you will see microgliosis in their brains. Literally, a neuroinflammatory flare-up. Same finding true for bipolar, same finding true for schizophrenia. There's a flare-up. 
that leads to suicide in all these major conditions. So a lot that we need to learn and understand. So how do we bring these GABA and glutamate signals, primarily GABA and neurosteroids, closer to our clinical con context? Well, one way uh, is of thinking about the function of major neural networks. So there are three neural networks that I would briefly discuss with you, and those of you who have been to uh, the earlier talk about circuits and cells uh, yesterday, I apologize, this may be repetitive. But uh, let's talk about the first network, and it's so-called salience network. Uh, salience network is connected to thalamus and uh, encompasses anterior cingulate, encompasses insula. The role of salience network is to accumulate all the sensory information and filter out sensory signals that are important versus the ones that are fluff, unimportant. So we know how clothes feel on our body, unimportant. As our sensory map is updated, that is dismissed. On the other hand, if you were to hear fire alarm and see smoke coming from the back of the room, that'd be pretty important sensory information. It is processed by salience network and converted into emotion. The emotion is probably concern and anxiety. So salience network informs us about important change in our environment. On the other hand, if there's an important change, we need to adapt. We need to do something about it. And that is when cognitive executive network steps in. So the hubs of cognitive executive network are the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and posterior parietal cortex. What will they do? As soon as the alarm starts going off, you immediately look around and memorize where the exits are. So it reallocates your attentional resources. Forget what this guy is droning about networks. Let's look how do we get out of here as fast as possible, right? You have different priorities at that point. All this information is stored in your working memory. And very close to cognitive executive network areas are premotor areas. So you start planning your motor behavior. How do I get out of here, right? But many times, there's really nothing to problem solve. And there's really nothing too exciting going on in our environment. And that is the time when default mode network is active. So the major hubs of default mode network include posterior cingulate cortex. Uh, uh, sometimes dors dorsomedial prefrontal cortex is involved. Ventromedial prefrontal cortex is always part of these midline default mode network structures. What are they involved in? Well, if we're not depressed, they are involved in planning. Uh, what are we going to do tomorrow? They're involved in processing social information. They are involved in composing music. They are involved in introspection. But if what if one becomes depressed? At that point, these functional networks that have good order, something major happens, forget default mode network, engage cognitive executive network, problem solve. That is not how it works in people who are depressed. Here is what happens in depressed individuals. Salience network generating negative emotion. An example, really a rough week at work. You have heard that your hospital is getting acquired. Not everybody's going to keep their job. As you're leaving, you meet your boss in the parking lot. Your boss said, I see you have had a rough week, huh? Mm -hmm. You know, there's something important I've been meaning to talk to you about. It's probably late now. Let's meet first thing Monday morning. Hope you enjoy your weekend. <laughs> right? Um, one could possibly interpret this negative signal. And if one is prone to depression, one will. And what will happen then? is negative emotion generated by salience network co-opts default mode network. And one starts with a cycle of ruminations. And they're both prospective and retrospective. 
we think about all the miserable experiences that we've had in our life and we're projecting ourselves into the future and it's never good. It's always the bleakest possible outcome. And having these non-productive ruminations that are driven by dark emotions also bleeds into the function of cognitive executive network and we can't think straight. So people who are depressed, instead of being externally oriented and problem solving, become internally preoccupied in this ever spinning vicious cycle, negative emotion, negative thoughts, negative emotion, negative thoughts, can't problem solve. So it's interesting how it works out, but uh, here we see that if there is intrusion of default mode network into the function of dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, again, a hub of cognitive executive network, it coincides with severity of depression. What does that have to do with our story? What it has to do with our story is what separates those networks, uncouples them, and puts them back into their physiologic mode is GABA function. So with proper GABA function, you're not going to have rumination and a barren default mode network activity interfere with your thinking, and it will uncouple it from salience network, so you will not have this reverberating cycle of misery. So very, very interesting promise, and indeed there are some preliminary clinical data using imaging to support this. In addition to that, as we have already mentioned, GABA signaling is involved in regulating stress response. Stress is one of the main activators of depression. That may be softened. And in peripartum depression, we also find that activation of this default mode network directly coincides with severity of depression in peripartum depression. So do neurosteroids play a role? It's an interesting study. These are neurosteroid levels at, it, during the second trimester, approximately week 19. And what we're finding out is that there's linear relationship between allopregnanolone during second trimester and the risk of postpartum depression after pregnancy. Uh, linear and very pronounced with every nanogram per milliliter, uh, the risk of depression is, I'm talking more allopregnanol, the risk of depression is decreased by 50%. Each nanogram, 50%, 50%, 50% decrease in risk of developing postpartum depression. So indeed, very influential. So major depressive disorder is associated with a barren pattern of communication of these functional networks. GABA has a lot to do with keeping these major neural networks functioning appropriately. If GABA signaling is compromised, they can mix. You can have intrusions. Uh, functional networks in GABA signaling also have to do with postpartum or peripartum depression. And allopregnanolone predicts the risk of postpartum disorder. So let us look at where allopregnanolone can work. Short answer is just about everywhere. It works on presynaptic receptors. It works on postsynaptic receptors. It works on intrasynaptic receptors as well as extrasynaptic receptors. It can be released by nerve cell and signaled back to it. So uh, it can have autocrine reaction. It can be released and signaled to other cells. It can may have paracrine interaction. And it can even signal within the cell and modulate the activity of GABA receptors. So it has very encompassing role in regulating GABA. Now, uh, do we indeed know that there are other treatments that can modulate GABA? So this is something that has nothing to do with neurosteroids. Transcranial magnetic stimulation. Transcranial magnetic stimulation did not change Glick signal, this is magnetic resonance spectros spectroscopy. Glicks is a mix of glutamate and glutamine. So TMS did not change glutamine-glutamate signaling in the brain, but it did change GABA. It did ramp up GABA signaling. As a matter of fact, the more successful it was, the more it ramped up GABA signal. How about ketamine? Prototypical glutamate intervention, yes, Ketamine is associated with increased glutamate bursting. Uh, 
and there's increase in glutamate. But look at this graph. Ketamine increases GABA even more than glutamate. So many of the treatments that we believed have something to do with monoamines or glutamate actually have to do with GABA as well. So this is a phase two study of one of the neurosteroids. It's derivative of allopregnanolone. It's called brexanolon, and it was used in treatment of postpartum depression. This is one of the early studies. This is a phase two study. You see the numbers are low, uh, 20, 20 patients, 10 in each arm, roughly. But what was remarkable is how robustly effective brexanolone was in postpartum depression. It was given as a 60-hour infusion. Uh, look at the red graphs. Those are remission rates. Blue is placebo. Dramatic improvement. Dramatic improvement literally within hours. Effect size, 1.2. To remind you, effect size of monoamine modulating antidepressants is around 0 0.4, 0 0.423. 1.2, robustly effective. But this is phase two. There is a larger study. This is phase three study, over 100 patients per arm. In a similar pattern, after 60 hour infusion, dramatic decrease in depression scores, which was then maintained over time. How about MDD? We mentioned something about MDD in the title. So this is a SAGE-217, uh, still experimental medication. Uh, Brandon mentioned this medication. Uh, SAGE-217 is one of the neurosteroids. It is given orally this time. This is not an infusion. It is given orally. Who are the patients here? They're individuals who are currently depressed about one in four of them were on antidepressants. They were on stable dose for antidepressants for four weeks, had no response. At that point, treatment with SAGE-217 was initiated. This is only a 15-week study, or at least this analysis is at 15, I'm sorry, 15 days, not 15 weeks, 15 days, so two weeks. Primary outcome measure was change in depression score over the course of two weeks. What happened? Uh, almost too good to be true. Within two weeks, remission rate with SAGE-217, 30 milligrams, was 64%. Remission rate with placebo was similar to what you see in other studies, 26%. Giving us a whopping number needed to treat of two and a half. To give you an idea, number needed to treat with conventional antidepressants is above 10. You're looking at 11, 12. So in, indeed, kind of data that we're really not used to seeing, and uh, I think we're all holding our fingers crossed that it'll come through in phase three studies. But in the meantime, there are several antidepressant treatments that are standard that also influence uh, GABA transmission, including TMS, including ketamine. Uh, neurosteroid brexanolone has established efficacy in treatment of postpartum depression. By the way, it was approved March 19th. It was approved for postpartum depression. So now we do have an antidepressant that is a neurosteroid. And there is positive preliminary evidence that one of the oral agents, H217, it may be quite effective in treatment of major depression. So uh, now we will review a quick case study, and I will ask Brandon uh, uh, to join me for that process. Uh, we will see what implication, if any, this might have to our practice. So do you want to introduce us to, to this patient, Brandon? Oh, of course. Uh, this is a 32-year-old married female, three weeks postpartum, who uh, went to her OBGYN. Uh, and he referred her for treatment for depression, which started during the last six weeks of gestation, feeling sad, tired most of the days. She's waking up often during the night. Very interesting. Sleep problem is there. Anhedonia, loss of interest and in work and hobbies. She also has to make herself play with her child. 
This Brandon, is... you have spoken to us about uh, peripartum depression. Oh, Anything here, here that, uh, that catches your attention? Yeah, well, the most important thing for me is that she's seriously depressed with a, a problem uh, associating uh, sleep as well, difficulty with sleep. And there's some irritability. You mentioned emotional instability yes. as being yes. one of the key factors. Yes. Uh, she's had three previous depressive episodes, and one of them uh, during a previous pregnancy, another predictor. Her daughter is five years old now. That's a stress, isn't it? Yes. Past yeah. five episodes responded to a combination of SSRIs and psychotherapy. However, treatment was cut short because of the emergence of sexual side effects and weight gain. And I know you have done a lot of work on SSRIs and sexual side effects. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Are we over-exaggerating this? No. Is it, uh, yeah. no, it, no. If we told all our patients up front, I'm going to give you a medication that will help you to feel better, but you're not going to be able to enjoy sex, have any interest in it, and you're going to gain some weight. You think would, they take would the not be very popular with my female no. patients. No, <laughs> not very popular. So she's ruminating. She's got that irritation in the default mode, mode network, network, isn't she? And her weight gain and the risk of losing her job is there. That's going to be more depressogenic. Anna fears that unless she can get it together, her husband may leave. Another depressive feature. More depression breeds depression. Sometimes the treatment of depression breeds depression. What do you say about her screener scores? Well, you know, 21 is moderately severe. It's severe depression, MDQ, and the EPDS over 12, so she's 18 there. So she's significantly depressed. So you would say that it would be fair to say she has put peripartum depression? I, yes, absolutely. So uh, let's see what we can do. Well, if I referred her to you, I know what you'd do. <laughs> <laughs> You would say it's time for you to get some neurosteroid. <laughs> uh, indeed, uh, Anna had uh, unremarkable uh, uh, pregnancy aside from having morning sickness in the first uh, trimester. She's a bit overweight. Her BMI is 28. Uh, that is something that can actually be relevant because there are studies suggesting that in uh, individuals who are overweight or obese, uh, antidepressants may have reduced efficacy. Is that because of hyperestrogenism? Uh, or possibly the risk of heightened inflammation that goes with higher BMI. So we're not certain, but there appears to be a correlation. And she was treated with an SSRI for six mm. weeks, and mm. uh, despite her partial improvement early on, it seems that antidepressants went only so far, and now her depression is worsening and she's beginning to feel hopeless. You said that suicidality is something that and is very worse. Absolutely, and it's the most common cause of suicide in a study in the UK and one in Australia in, in the uh, postpartum period. Suicide is the most common cause of death in the moms. So we should have some sense of urgency in this situation. So. Uh, we're also finding out that endocrine factors uh, with screening of thyroid function seems to be within normal limits. Well, we didn't have this option earlier, did we? I'm no, sure she... we, we didn't. So we're now thinking about what will help decrease, uh, 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 help her depression, but decrease the risk of, of gaining weight, decrease the risk of sexual dysfunction. And then there is an appealing and approved medication specifically for peripartum depression. So uh, Anna did receive a 60-hour infusion of Brexanolon and is now returning for two-week follow-up. So what does Anna say? Well, that's dramatic. She's much brighter and reports substantially improved mood, energy, sleep, sexual response, and enthusiasm. Seems almost too good to be true, doesn't it? But it isn't. This is real. <laughs> Her first two days of treatment, Anna experienced some somnolence. So she, had, she slept very well. She got her sleep. And uh, she had a transient dizziness, transient nausea. These side effects at first abated and then completely stopped. And by the way, those are some of the more common adverse reactions in both Brexanolon and SAGE-217 trials. Uh, all of them were in single digits. But in terms of the ones that were slightly different than placebo, they did have to do with dizziness, nausea, and sleepiness. And the SAGE-217 is an oral agent. It's not an IV. It's not an IV. You're absolutely correct. So what happened with her depression wow. scores? Well, I think it's phenomenal. She's in very mild depression. She's actually down to a 7, um, almost out of depression, and feeling bright and enthusiastic. And her Edinburgh score went down to 6.
below the 12 um, score. So this looks like a win all the way down the line. Yeah, so this is the kind of outcome that we can only hope for. Mm -hmm. So in summary, a significant number of patients suffering from major depressive disorder or postpartum depression uh, are not being helped appropriately. They still have residual symptoms which are handicapping. They may also suffer from suicidal ideation. We're now finding that major depressive disorder is not only about monoamines. It's a heterogeneous condition. There are multiple different pathophysiologies that underlie major depressive disorder, including disruption in GABA and neurosteroid signaling. Now, well, one other thing that strikes me, and we yes. have to worry, are we choosing the correct therapy? Are we giving a patient with possible bipolar disorder right. um, unipolar treatment, which is not good? Right. What about rexanolone? Yeah, it's kind of interesting, but very, very, so take this with a huge grain of salt, but very preliminary evidence uh, suggests that neurosteroids may not be harmful in bipolar disorder. As a matter of fact, they may help with the anxiety, may help with depression, may help with sleep, may help with pain threshold. And they don't may make it worse. May help with stress response. There is uh, no suggestion they're actually worsening bipolar disorder. So something definitely uh, to consider. And uh, it, is, it is good uh, to be cautiously optimistic because we've both seen many medicines that l looked great in phase two. And in phase three, things did not go so smoothly. So let's, let's reserve our judgment. But would you say that as far as preliminary data is concerned, very this helpful. is very encouraging. Very encouraging. Yeah. We are here for any questions and answers for the next five minutes. And after that, if we, yeah. if anyone likes. Should I go on this one? OK. Um, I had a patient throw a question towards me that I really had no idea and I was going to wait until the perinatal session to ask, but it is actually maybe applicable to y'all. Um, she maxed out on labor induction the Pitocin and since then she's been having an issue uh, with depression, postpartum depression, and so her idea was that maybe um, women who have a Pitocin induced labor um, have some other disturbance then to maybe some of their natural occurring hormones that leads uh, to a greater proclivity or propensity for postpartum. Right. Uh, I'm not aware that uh, uh, now having labor complications is something that is a risk for, for depression. But I'm, I'm not aware of strong association between pitocin and onset of depression itself as a causal factor. I don't know if you've heard anything aware different, either. Brandon. Okay. But there are fluctuations, aren't yeah, there? Yeah, no, obviously there, there are individual differences, yes. Sure. Any other? Yes, please. Could you comment on uh, baseline inflammation levels and how they relate to everything you've been speaking on and then also how lifestyle modification can then influence that? So baseline inflammation and is that a factor? Uh, there actually are longitudinal studies showing that with greater peripheral inflammation, there is increased risk of depression. Uh, there are studies showing that uh, uh, duration of inflammation coincides with severity of depression. Uh, there are studies uh, clearly showing that peripheral inflammation is associated. Uh, uh, this is a Felger study published just last year showing the peripheral inflammation is significantly associated with central inflammation. And there are also studies showing that higher inflammation levels are associated with lesser response, not only to antidepressants, but also second generation antipsychotics. So there, there's a pretty tight uh, relationship there. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so you know, the other thing is that, that in primary care, I'm, I'm looking at cardiovascular disease. Cardiovascular disease is absolutely related to, to inflammatory process, and we're using lots of statins, lots of fish oil, and other things to try to reduce the inflammation. So, well, inflammation in the brain, yep. I mean, well, it's all they've, over the body. They've, they've looked at levels of sugar intake and inflammation in the blood and how dietary interventions can be related to um, mood disorders. So the question is about dietary interventions in depression. There are, interestingly enough, uh, uh, studies about dietary interventions in depression and dietary interventions uh, when it comes to inflammation. Uh, 
Um, unfortunately, uh, we are much better at making uh, conclusions about what proper diet can do to increase risk of depression. And we're finding that so-called modified Mediterranean diet or so-called anti-inflammatory diet. So it is diet that would be based essentially on raw vegetables, fruit, seafood, lean proteins, nuts, olive oil, uh, seems to be associated with decreased risk of depression in the long run. On the other hand, there is much less evidence that if somebody has bad depression and you create dietary change, that it can ameliorate symptoms. So uh, those, those data are unfortunately not as available. Thank you. Hi. Uh, in one of the talks yesterday, uh, there was mention of a negative allosteric modulation of GABA receptors by different forms of DHEA. Yes. Can you elaborate on that, please? So DHEA is a building block for neurosteroids. Some of the neurosteroids are positive modulators. Unfortunately, it is also a building block for negative modulators. Uh, and therefore, depending on which compounds are synthesized at a greater rate, it can go in either direction. Right. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I had a question about the relationship between glucocorticoids and um, allopregnenolone. I do some transplant psychiatry, and I have patients that are on chronic prednisone. And I'm wondering um, if this, if there's any thought that this intervention might be... Uh, so if there is uh, excessive uh, corticosteroid transmission, uh, use of allopregnanolone can bring it to equilibrium, can diminish excessive stress response and excessive glucocorticoid signaling. And a very quick question, oral uh, pregnenolone that someone can get at a supplement? Uh, so uh, I, I, I'm not aware of a whole lot of data in controlled studies with oral pregnenolone, but uh, uh, the, the SAGE-217, so the problem with allopregnenolone, for example, is it has very high first uh, pass metabolism. And that's why the side chain was changed into brexanolone, which was then given as IV infusion. Uh, obviously, this is a little bit awkward as well. So the molecule was further modified, and that's actually SAGE-217. It is uh, an oral version with uh, a lesser first-pass metabolism of uh, a pregnenolone derivative. And again, it seems to be quite effective so far. Thank you. Thank you. I have a patient over the last two years, uh, a 38-year-old male who uh, had his, I guess his third depressive episode, failed every antidepressant on the market, augmentation hasn't worked, ECT failed. The only, he asked me, what about TMS? I said, well, I don't know about that. If ECT, ECT failed, I'm not sure TMS would be any better, but there is a suggestion from your presentation. I, I have seen identical twin of that patient. So um, what, what ended up working for, for my patient was actually esketamine. Uh, it'll be interesting to see. I really look forward to SAGE-217 being available as another treatment option. But uh, uh, glutamate NMDA receptor modulating agents uh, are also appropriate. Uh, also coming down the pike, so again, neurosteroids are, are one wonderful opportunity for some of our, I'm not going to say that we're going to work for everybody, but they may work as so a subsegment of the patients who have not responded to treatment so far. The other thing is uh, there are also some very promising data coming from uh, psilocybin studies. And uh, it, it also has a very robust effect in treatment-resistant depression. So uh, I would say let's stay tuned. There are interesting possibilities. In the meantime, I would also try GABA, I, I'm sorry, I would try glutamate modulating agents. Thank you. So with those um, networks where you were seeing those changes and those major functional networks and major depressive disorder? Yes. Are you able to distinguish is there any differences in the persons with the bipolar disorder or schizophrenia from in those uh, networks? Yes, the findings are actually very different. So uh, when it comes to default to mode network function, um, this coupling with salience network and this intrusion in cognitive executive network, uh, 
is very prominent in depression. Interestingly enough, people who are bipolar will have increased DMN activity and rumination, both during depression and mania. Uh -huh. In schizophrenia, default mode network uh, activity, much like other uh, uh, functional networks in, in schizophrenia, uh, are, they're disconnected. There is aberrant, it's, it's kind of a free-for-all chaos when it comes to functional network in, in schizophrenia, unfortunately. So integrity of all the networks is impaired. Uh, we're getting a signal that unfortunately we'll have to end. Again, I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.